I'm just trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? The Facebooking and the tweeting and the Instagramming, all that would not exist without our understanding of science. So it's amazing that you took that as an insult. You mean true for you is different from true for anybody else? Have yeah, something to absolutely, true for you? because I can't think either got to be true or not. I can't, no, no. Well, let's see. Happy New Year! Welcome to O'Reilly Radio 140 for Friday, January 13th, a Friday the 13th, 2017, where we dismantle the current events for your edutainment through mostly rational conversations that make you go, oh, really? I'm your host, Andy Cowan, with my usual suspects. I've got Stephen Griffith, I've got Amber Besecker, and I've got Fred Sims. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, how was your New Year? How, how were your holidays and, and Festivus and, and all the stuff for the rest of us? Actually, pretty good. I I had a very good New Year's, as you would know. Um, that was fun. That was fun. Yes. No, nothing like the experiment of let's make an open pit fire made with coals and try to cook over it on the outside. And it surprisingly turning out functional and nobody's suffering severe burns, though a couple of pieces of food did commit suicide. We're, I, I think that all the food was at least cooked right. But if it wasn't yes. cooked right, then it was their fault. Some decided just to drive drive straight into the coals, though. But yeah, no, it was that does happen. It it was good. It was fun. People are invited next time, so I had a good time, and it was a, it was a good send off to 2016. I'll say that much. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Okay, Fred, Amber, you did you do anything fun for the holidays? No. Okay. No. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. Take take all the yeah. wind out of my sails. Okay. Yeah, I. I, I think it's weird to be happy New Year's in 13 days into the month. That just means we've been slacking. Um, it, but a, as far as New Year's and the end of the year, I mean, my, my birthday is the 30th, so that's always a, a nice New Year's killer. But I got a Lego Millennium Falcon, so I spent the end of and beginning uh, of the year basically building that, which was phenomenal. Excellent. Excellent. I've always wanted one of those. Um, I don't know where I'd put it now, and I'd don't want my children to have it honestly so because that I'm, well that, that was greedy the thing, like that. it was one of those purchases that i always wanted but mm -hmm. could never justify for myself yeah. and then my mom was just like oh yeah i'll get you one and i was like well i'm not paying for it so that sounds great uh <laughs> built it and because of the cats can't keep it at the house so i took it to work and put it on my desk you hey. did yeah it's sitting on the top of my i have like a hutch on the top of my desk so it sits right above me. I can look at I've got all the figures set up. Um, it's got actual live wow. working little Lego missiles and Chewbacca's bowcaster actually shoots out little red things. So if people piss me off, I could just attack them. <laughs> I like this plan. I'm proud to be a part of it. It's great. Okay. Well, <clears throat> we make mistakes, folks. We make them all the time. And this year is not going to be any exception. So please, if you find one, let us know about it. Go ahead and send us a note over to O'Reilly Radio Podcast. That's O-R-L-Y-R-A-D-I-O-P-O-D-C-A-S-T, in case you can't spell it, at gmail.com. Or, of course, you can phone it in. We still have that, that voice line number at 470-222-6759. And if uh, you, you don't want to talk to us or anything, but you still want, want to do something real fast, you can send us a text, too. For all those millennials out there that... Don't do the talking on the phone thing. Of course, I don't like to do the talking on the phone thing either, and I'm not a lonely all. So there you go. All right. So um, in uh, our top stories of uh, the beginning here of the year are all still talking about the election and the run up to Trump taking the White House. So um, that's still happening. That is still a thing. Yeah. In fact, our... Next week's show happens to fall on the 20th, which is Inauguration Day. Um, so um, if, I, if I can somehow manage to bring myself out of the bottle that I will probably be crawled into, we'll have some sort of show or festivity uh, going on here. It may, may just be lamenting the loss of the Republic, but we'll see how it goes. Um, but we ought to do a little examination of... <sighs> What's going to happen in Washington here real soon? We've hey, Andy? Yeah. I am so sorry to interrupt you, but I have a listener telling me that they can't hear you. They can hear everybody else, but not you. But they can't hear me. Mm -mm. 
Yours is kind of the important voice. Mine is, <laughs> mine is kind of the important voice. Well, well, curses foiled again. Um, I mean, if it makes you feel any better, I can hear you. I can hear you too. Well, I think you're just a voice in my head. Okay. Uh, huh. Where are they listening from? Um, yeah, who's actually listening to us? <laughs> Tell them to stop. I mean, oh, wait, they're listening no, from like them. the the Union Park area. Like, what I'm saying is, it Twitch or is it Facebook? Uh, let me ask her. Because if not one, try to switch to the other and see if it's coming through. Also, uh, perhaps now they can hear me. Um, I did. Yeah, they should be able to hear me now. So I she did. Says uh, she's on Facebook. Yeah, I did. Just uh, I in trying to clean up the audio. Yep, she can hear you. I made it so that you couldn't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> how do we kill the, the static on the line by so, killing the line? So that's apparently how that worked. Um, so terribly sorry, uh, but uh, thank you for the feedback. Otherwise, we wouldn't have known. So <clears throat> um, thank you, Callie. Yes, thank yeah, you, Callie. Thank you thank very you. much. <laughs> um, <laughs> curses foiled again. I mean, okay. how awesome would the show have been for everybody to just hear us to respond to stuff Andy said? Like he goes through his whole intro, and then it's like, oh yeah, no, my New Year's was all right. I did this and this, and they're like, what the hell are they talking about? Well, that's pretty much what it was going on, I think, because they probably didn't hear any of the sound effects or any. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. So, anywho, um, so. If you're missing the first part of that show, just you know, <laughs> catch us in the in the uh, replay, and and you'll catch the first minute and a half or whatever. Okay, <clears throat> sorry about that. And now I'm all distracted and everything, and now I got to talk about Trump's cabinet picks. Damn it! She Damn tried it. Wow. to help you. She I, really did. I think that I think that was probably better off because I don't really want to talk about this, but it's something consciously you were like, I'm just going to mute my audio. <laughs> Screw it. Yeah, I'm told <laughs> the host of the show is not important. I don't know. Jeez. Okay. <clears throat> but we got that figured out now. Um, okay. I may actually be even too loud coming out there, but wait, we'll figure it out. Anyway. Um, all right. So Russian hacking. That was a thing as well. Or was it? I guess it yeah, was. it looks just like Fallout 4. Maybe it was. <laughs> <laughs> or Fallout 3 or Fallout 2. Um <clears throat> yeah, a lot of the uh, the the graphics for hacking they stole directly from Fallout, which is absolutely hilarious. But there was a um, an executive order number thirteen thousand seven hundred and fifty seven, December twenty eighth. It went into effect on January first, um, taking additional steps to address the national emergency with respect to significant malicious cyber enabled activities. It just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Um, now, I don't know if anybody has actually read an executive order, but it starts off kind of kind of fancy and all, all legalistic here. <clears throat> by the authority vested in me as president by the Constitution and the laws of the United States of America, including the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, the National Emergencies Act, and Section 301 of Title III, the United States Code. Oh, I Barack Obama. I am obviously not Barack Obama. President of the United States of America. Obviously also no longer President of the United States of America. In order to take additional steps to deal with the national emergency with respect to significant malicious cyber-enabled activities declared in Executive Order 1000, no, 13,694 of April 1st, 2015, and in view of the increasing use of such activities to undermine democratic processes or institutions, here by order. And then there's a lot of stuff. Um, I find it interesting that you can use an exec another executive order to modify a previous executive order. And these all become law. And we wonder why there's so many lawyers. <laughs> yeah, it seems like a, a crazy little rabbit hole to go down if you're starting to modify all the previous ones with yeah. each, you know, successive one. Yeah. I... Okay. Fred? It's an interesting rabbit hole. Let's go on. <laughs> yeah. Fred, you, you were um, you were a law enforcement officer for a Once upon a time. a time. And how do, how do law enforcement officers even begin 
to figure out what's legal and what's not. There's a book. How big is the book? The state of Florida. <laughs> um, I mean, is it uh, is it like the book, like the one that you'd get thrown at you? Is it really huge and you cannot get out from underneath it kind of book? Or is it like just a pamphlet? Well, no, no, it's it's fairly large. Like it puts the Bible to shame. Um, the, I used to have one that was, you know, like 2007s. Um, and uh, I don't know if you guys have ever seen like um, – I'm trying to think of like something somewhat common. So like maybe like the girl with the dragon tattoo and paperback um, is a fairly thick yeah. book. Um, it would be like maybe two of those, maybe like one and a half, two of those. So like this, like when they say they're going to hit you with the book, you better fucking duck. So is it like, <laughs> like three inches thick kind of thing or. Yeah, easily. I mean, it, it it's a good size, and the one I had was like a little paperback version, uh, not little paperback version, but um, uh, roughly um, a little bit larger than like your standard Bible in height, and then just you know, like you said, about three inches thick, and it's got every you know um, the all the laws, all the different um, subsections, and the and the different codes and um, statutes and everything's in there. You know what it's called? The, the Florida book. statute book. Um, <laughs> I do. I do not recall off the top of my head, but I believe if you search like um, Florida statutes or Florida laws, you can uh, you'll pull it up, and it should direct you to that information. Okay, and that's strictly Florida laws, so that wouldn't have any of these executive orders in it, would it? No, most likely not. I mean, okay. that, I mean, you're probably talking about a separate book unto itself for those. Yeah, this is why when you walk into a, a reputable lawyer's office, there's like a giant bookcase full of everything. Uh, because oh, I mean, lots the, of books. the law office that I work at now, we have bookcases like our our large conference room is entirely lined with bookcases. Um, we have bookcases on the wall outside of that. Our small conference room has a bookcase. I mean, there's literally books everywhere. And we are subrogation law. That's it. I mean, we don't even get into criminal Hmm. That's a lot of books. So, <clears throat> so given your book, I know I'm going down a, a different trail here, but it's more interesting than what we're going to talk about. So, how how do they approach what you ought to know out of that book? I, 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 clearly, you're supposed to know the whole thing. It, well, it, I mean, my <laughs> version of law enforcement would be a little bit different. So. Um, because I was in corrections, mm -hmm. even though I was a deputy, I didn't have um, – I didn't have like arrest powers that you would think of as a standard deputy. Like I couldn't go and put handcuffs on you and take you to, to the jail okay. um, or even to the lockup at the, the precinct until you got transported to the jail. But I could, if absolutely necessary, detain people because I was a deputy. Mm -hmm. But there were still standards that were different. And where you get into that – would be through your academy. And so what happens is the um, Florida Department of Law Enforcement requires a certain amount of hours in um, the various subjects. So for the corrections, I believe it was 480 classroom hours in which I had to learn um, various things, including the uh, self-defense aspect, the first responder aspect. There were two legal courses in which they taught us different things, but they were tailored to working in a jail because that's what you were going to be doing. So mm -hmm. I didn't learn obviously all the, the laws for being on, you know, the road and, and, you know, those type of violations. I was mainly learning laws in how it related to, um, in inmates daily life in the jail. Uh, also my daily life going to the jail, what things would be against the law for me to do or for me to bring or say, mm -hmm. or, you know, my activities. So there were that portion is what I had to learn when you're actually going through LEO. I believe the hours jump to over five or 600. Um, and you learn, there's two other legal courses that you have to take, and I don't think you have to learn them all because I believe that it ends up being you're going to continually learn those things as you go. You just have to put down a pretty healthy basis um, mm -hmm. of what those laws are hmm. because when you go through and do your actual certification test, 
they're going to ask you, it's going to be not unlike the bar in which there's going to be a lot of questions that are testing what you learned about the laws through your, um, you know, academy. Mm -hmm. And presumably if you were to transfer from corrections into, um, other field work or anything like that, you'd also have to then go back and, and get those certifications as well. Yes. So what they would do in that case is they have what they call a crossover academy that makes up the difference in hours between the two. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if there was a little bit extra, but there are some things that you have to learn that you didn't in the corrections academy. So you would have to go and learn. Um, I believe there are two road courses in which they teach you to drive the car. I don't think they did all that well with many officers, but um, <laughs> they they do have a road course that they have you on and then they have you practicing like traffic stops and um, they do some stuff with like DUI stops uh, and then you take the additional legal courses that you didn't take. You may have some refreshers on the other stuff, um, basically giving you those differences between the two. They offered it – one time while I was in the jail, I was not able to make it happen, but I really wanted to. Because if you were dual certified, uh, obviously you were a bigger asset to the sheriff's office. I just wasn't able to make it happen at the time, so I oh. only had the one certification. Huh. Well, that's very interesting. Probably a lot more interesting than the rest of what we're going to talk about. But <clears throat> So you, you only had a, a subsection of the law that you had to had to focus on. And other right. other law enforcement officers also only have just so much that they really have to know. And yet, probably percentage-wise, like less than 5% of all law it gets covered by those that are actually there to enforce it. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm just spitballing. Yeah, that, and that's a, but, I, don't, I don't even know if I could – could verify that amount it, it's but i mean when you think about it you're probably pretty close because you got to think they're looking at laws and and uh statutes for you know the state of florida and mm -hmm. then you get you can get down to you know you, you miss uh i can't even say that word municipalities Municipal. yeah. yeah they may have different rules and laws or statutes for their area that are totally different so if you go from let's take for example Merritt island which you know how do you – you guys are classified as what out there? It is an unincorporated section of Brevard County, so it actually just goes with the county law. And then you get to a city like Coco, which would then have city law and then county law and then state law. So as you yeah. build – you know, it, so you may, as a Coco police officer, have a, a whole other section or just differences, slight differences in laws that you have to learn from what you learned when – you went through the academy and got your certification because you were learning based off of the FDLE, which they are obviously governing the entire state of Florida and yeah. looking for that basic. You pass these classes with these grades, meet this requirement, here's your certification, now go learn what you really need to do. Yeah, and, and I think we can probably be pretty safe to say that this is also how it would be in other other states as well. Um, yes. Same basic thing because there's also the federal law. And some of those, of course, you're going to have to learn also, like um, properly, you know, reading someone their Miranda rights. Um, that's a federal statute, but that would also be probably replicated somewhere in the Florida Department of Law Enforcement that it also has to be done just to echo it. It wouldn't surprise me yeah, at all if that were the case to, totally to le um, legitimize it. Hmm. Yeah, just just to, you know. Basically make sure like, hey, you will lose arrests this way if you don't cover your bases. Yeah. And yet they say, and I think we're, we're all aware of this, that uh, if you're not – not knowing the law is not an excuse. I know that right. that's Ignorance of the law is not an excuse. Ignorance Just because you didn't know you were breaking the law doesn't right. mean that you get off from having broken the law. Right. Which is great when – a lot of the laws, no one knows. You know, those like obscure ones, like you're not supposed to, you know, hitch your um, your elephant during certain hours on certain days on the uh, public for thoroughfare or something. Yeah, it it's like a real law. It's weird. Somewhere in Maine, I think, does that. Um, <clears throat> was was Maine having like a considerable amount of their population bring elephants onto the main thoroughfare and beating beating them? I blame Barnum, maybe Bailey. Well, 
considering <laughs> Maine's closeness to Canada and the fact that those Canadians get up to all kinds of crazy stuff, <laughs> I would say that what they were was illegal immigrant elephants, <laughs> and that's why they were being beaten. They're all high on that poutine. Well, I mean, they'd have to be immigrants because I don't think elephants are native to Canada. No. <laughs> they cross the land bridge that the 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 Mormon white people that took the land – or had their land taken from them by Indians. There's a lot going on. Look, I don't need the you one... to question my elephant knowledge. <laughs> sure, is, is that an elephant, or, cross, a, right? is that an elephant yes. or a shaved mammoth? Could be a shaved mammoth. Okay, so we've we've digressed. Um, anyway, so there, there were additional uh, economic sanctions placed against Russia in particular over, um, over the hacking that occurred. And... All of the major agencies, CIA, FBI, all the other three-letter agencies and some that have more, uh, they all came down and said, yeah, Russia is pretty much responsible for some hacking. Both the RNC and the DNC were both hacked. The DNC emails are the ones that were released to WikiLeaks. Curious? Maybe? I don't think we need to go to David O'Connor's House of Tinfoil Hats in order <laughs> to find out you know, exactly what kind of conspiracy theories you can get up to with that. It is suspicious, uh, to say the very least. Yeah. But um, really, I don't know why this presidency is going to be legitimized in any way. There's so many things. At, at some point, you just kind of have to call for another election, don't you? Another general election throw out the, the baby with the bathwater and start over? I, I mean, it's not going to happen, though. It won't, but, I mean, why why don't we? Why can't we? Is it just... Are we all just so defeated? I think I, you, you <laughs> end up setting a precedent that people are afraid to set. Well, it's also like you, a matter of yeah. where the odds are stacked. You know, like, the people who have really the power here are all the people who are supporting Trump. So Yeah. I think for me part of it is also I'm sitting back, you know, watching all the stuff going on, seeing what people are saying, seeing what people are doing. And no matter how much I again, I'm using the F word as much as I throw facts at people. Oh, um, that F word. Yeah. And and back up everything and show them all the reasoning and everything else. And they'll you always hear, I'll just give him a chance. I'll just do this. Oh, it won't be that bad. Oh, this won't happen. I'm going, all right, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to keep saying these things, but for the most part, I'm just going to sit over here. And when everything starts exploding and burning down, you start looking at me going, what happened? I'm going to laugh in your face. <laughs> and I'll be like, I told you. <laughs> now let's go fix it. But I get five minutes of uninterrupted laughter. I I think five minutes is, is probably, um, a really conservative estimate of how long I'll be laughing, though there will be tears in my eyes because I probably won't be able to figure out which one I need to do more of. Laugh, or there might be laugh, tear gas. Cry. Oh, yeah, could be, could be tear gas. Why don't they put some nitrous oxide in with the tear gas? Because then first. people wouldn't leave. <laughs> <laughs> you really want people huffing tear gas containers because you know that would start happening. I'm not going to say bad. no. I'm not going to say no. I'm also not going to say yes. <laughs> so sure do whatever okay <clears throat> now um what do you guys think of his cabinet picks <sighs> that good huh yeah, there's well uh, number <laughs> burn it <laughs> the, the third one we have on the list is actually one i'm going okay he said something that i'm actually kind of happy about which is strange but Let's start with the first one we've got listed, which is Dr. Sleepy. Yeah, in, in, I, I, I put down in, in our show notes, which will be available at OReallyRadio.com for show 140, uh, I put down the list of the people that he has chosen and their Wikipedia entry. So you can find out a little bit more about whoever they happen to be. Uh, there's going to be a few names that you'll go, you're going to recognize if you've been paying attention to Anything. At all, really. And the very first one is Dr. Sleepy, Dr. Ben Carson. Just remember, folks, he is a neurosurgeon. I wouldn't want him poking around my brain. He is a neurosurgeon. Actually, him poking around in your brain is f probably fine. Him telling you what all those little bits do, I would say no. 
But he but can poke he around been, in your brain very, very this professionally. This is the Jesus wrinkle, and this is the Jesus wrinkle, <laughs> and this is the Jesus wrinkle. And this is where we keep all the grain. <laughs> and this is where oh. Satan enters your head. Your brain's a pyramid? <laughs> well, I mean, Love it. isn't yours? <laughs> I, I honestly don't know. I'm not a neurosurgeon. It's they all. could all be Jesus wrinkles. <laughs> <laughs> I keep my third eye inside my Illuminati pyramid, which is yeah, somewhere right. somewhere in my brain. Um, it's a safe place to I just yeah. I don't understand why the first name on the list is a name on the list, considering <laughs> he was offered another position and said, you know, I, I'm not really cut out for this political like I, I shouldn't be running a, 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 you know, one of these governmental offices. He was and, offered, uh, I believe it was health and human services, which is hilarious because that would be like more in his wheelhouse, kind of. Yeah. But I feel like he kind of looked at this and just went like I. I can handle houses. Houses are simple. Yeah, for, like for, you just put a you just put a a triangle on top of a square, and that's yeah. Know. Well, there are <laughs> out there. Ben Carson was tagged for housing being and the head of the housing and urban development, or HUD. If you now you know what HUD stands for, yeah. <laughs> um, which is you have your one minority. <laughs> I was just going there, in, yeah. Yeah, in ahead of HUD, and here's it. Did anybody see um, Elizabeth Warren during his confirmation? I no, I saw I, I saw bits and pieces. There's only so much of this that I can actually stomach without actually having an aneurysm and and starting to vomit compulsively all over everything in front of me. Well, she essentially took him to task, asking him, could he guarantee that President Elect Trump and his family would not benefit? in any way from any of the HUD policies. And he couldn't answer the question because we have no way of knowing. This goes back to him not releasing his taxes and essentially keeping his business locked up. It, we have no idea whether or not he's going to be making money off of being able to have someone in charge of setting policy for HUD. I, it, you know, It could also be that he has no idea what HUD does. There's well, that too. There's I mean, I'm just, too, yeah, I, I'm just thinking, just spitballing. He, he may have no idea what the job actually entails. Son of a bitch. He took this job because HUD sounds like it does when he says the word head. He's 100% sure he's operating on brains. <laughs> <laughs> My God. <laughs> oh, oh, head cannon accepted. Okay. Um, head cannon? Head cannon. Nice. Um, yep. So. <clears throat> Let's move along on the list. <laughs> Jeff sure. Sessions no. for, for Attorney racist. General. I object. You object? Mm -hmm. Jefferson Beauregard Sessions the <laughs> third. Someone well, has to. Name? Yes, that is his name. Just well, let's follow let's the honest. follow the right. link. Jefferson and Beauregard Jeff Sessions the third in Selma, Alabama in 1946. But let's also be a little bit honest here in the fact that you know that somebody at some point in this country had to replace Strom. <laughs> Look what we got. Samantha B was like Samantha B was like, that makes Sessions the second most racially charged thing to ever come out of Selma. <laughs> oh, that's I good. Say, I that's do like good. his wife's name. What's Mary Blackshear Sessions. Sessions, uh, well. Why, it gotta um, be black. I'm not even gonna, I'm not even gonna touch that one. Uh, Sessions was considered as a possible vice presidential nominee as well, but unfortunately there was another bigot out there, and, uh, I'm sorry, there was another man out there that was obviously qualified, Indiana Governor Mike Pence. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so. Yeah, as they were brought up, let's remember, Jeff Sessions was at one point deemed too racist to be a federal judge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's this, not forget this. This Remember happened. this. And yeah, yeah. And he wants you know sexual assault survivors to just shut the fuck up. There's that. Yeah, makes you wonder what his history's like, right? Mm. Uh, he was now amazingly enough, he might actually be qualified for the job itself because he he has already had experience as attorney general of Alabama before he became a senator. So he has actually done the job. But I feel like if you are, you are deemed too racist to be 
you know, a judge that disqualifies you from a lot of things past that point, regardless of your resume. Well, he's he's not a good person. Yeah. Um, I think we can go with that. Let's yeah. see. He was a... Uh, he proposed national amendment. No, he opposed. No, wait. Wait, wait, wait. He supported the major legislative efforts George W. Bush administration, including the 2001-2003 tax, pack, tax cut packages. He supported the Iraq War and a proposed national amendment to ban same-sex marriage. He opposed the establishment of the Troubled Asset Relief Program and the 2009 Stimulus Bill, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, and Don't Ask, Don't Tell Repeal Act. He has earned a zero rating from the Human Rights Campaign, the United States' largest LGBTQ advocacy group. He voted against the Matthew Shepard Act, which added acts of bias-motivated violence based on sexual orientation and gender identity to federal hate crimes law, commenting that it has been said to cheapen the civil rights movement. <laughs> cheapen. Nice. Yeah. Okay. So he's also a proponent of the uh, Trump proposed ban on Muslims, and as Attorney General, he would be in a good place to help kick that off. He was also one of the 34 senators to vote against the Stem Cell Research Enhancement Act of 2007, which would have provided funding for human embryonic stem cell research. So, I mean, like, yeah, it, you know, he's not a good person, but the bigger problem is that that affects how he votes and what laws he puts into effect and, and everything else. Yeah. Is that he legislates the fact that he's a, a turd. Yeah. Um, the reason that he's still a senator uh, is because nobody ran against him, really. Um. As the uh, on the Republican right, everyone else was a right in. There were no Democrats on the ticket, so he he walked away with a, with ninety seven point two five percent of the vote. When Them's he was Putin elected. numbers, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Basically, uh, th that was the the latest in twenty fourteen when he was uh, reelected. Uh, but before that, he also had very serious uh, uh, numbers previously. But he's actually just become more and more popular in the great state of Alabama. This man, who we've just spoken of, Mr. Jeff Sessions. Yeah. So he's going to be the attorney general, it looks like. Um, or at least potentially. Um, a lot of these nominees weren't doing really great during their, um, their hearings. Their confirmation hearings. Uh, it's almost like it all falls apart under scrutiny. It is. Almost. Unfortunately, almost. Cause, but Amber, I mean, yeah. as you know, how do you feel? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like ethics doesn't matter anymore, apparently, <laughs> because they're not doing any full background checks on these people. They're not making them uphold the same standards that other people have previously. Well, the the problem, the real problem ends up becoming that it doesn't matter in the end. And what I mean by that is you can have someone like Al Franken take Jeff Sessions to task mm -hmm. for lying uh, about the cases he covered as attorney general in Alabama and have Jeff Sessions stumble over everything he's saying trying to argue back and – there's more Republicans that are going to vote to confirm him than there are Democrats that are going to fight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, I mean, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. It's like, wow, you guys are putting on a fantastic show, but you know, you're doing nothing like, well, yep. speaking of the show, let's continue. James <laughs> Mattis for the defense secretary, James mad dog Mattis. <laughs> and yeah, I'm here's, not here's kidding. one thing I will say. <laughs> Out of all of the cabinet picks, despite the nickname mm -hmm. and despite the Warhawk mentality, this is probably the best and most qualified pick that he has. Yeah. I, I will agree with that. There are a couple things I like about him. Um, mostly, I do like the fact of what he said recently during his confirmation hearing when he was pressed about 
LGBT and women in the military. And he basically said, I don't care who anyone, you know, what two consenting adults do in the bedroom. I don't care who you go to bed with. It doesn't matter to me. My job is to make the U.S. military as lethal a fighting force as possible and ended it. I'm going, well, good. That's exactly what you should be. It's like, I'm not repealing this stuff. There's no reason they can't fight. Let's just go. My job is to make the military function. Yeah. The um, issue he's going to run into, however, is that he was appointed is, by Barack Obama. No, is the fact there is a federal <laughs> law that says the Secretary of Defense, a, a person who has to be a civilian, and may not be appointed as Secretary of Defense within seven years after relief from active duty. He retired in 2013. He would literally have to have Congress waive that requirement for him for him to take the post. Uh, well, hang on though. <clears throat> President Obama appointed Mattis to replace General Petraeus on August 11th, 2010. So he's already doing the job. Currently commander of the United States Central Command. That's different, though. That's, that's CENTCOM. That's not um, a se Secretary of Defense. Okay. So wouldn't he just be out i mean if 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 there's that limitation why would he even be listed then well no they're they are talking about having congress um push through a waiver so that he's able to do it yeah uh, it's saying okay this okay. guy's this guy's who we want this guy meets all the requirements everything else he passes muster okay there's just this one little hiccup of him not being inside the window can we waive that for him sure and again, honestly, yeah. if He's it's the one He's person that he made yeah. the right pick on, I'd <clears throat> rather not have them remove him and see if he can royally screw this one up, too. Well, yeah. you know, he might not be the only one that actually has some qualifi qualifications. So let's let's carry on. I, but I think we can probably say that uh, Mattis is Mattis, James Mad Dog Mattis, uh, because how can you avoid that? Uh, he's probably going to be OK. Um, but let's. Let's talk about the Secretary of State. Uh, do we have to? Yes. Yes, I believe we do. Rex Tillerson, current president, CEO of ExxonMobil. And, you know, kind of political, economic bedfellow of Russia. He is the proper Cause, cause that obviously upper happens. class, very articulate version of drill, baby, drill. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Bringing it back. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I spoke with my mother yesterday, and she was gushing over Rex Tillerson. <laughs> and how. Well, was she gushing oil? Because that stuff's worth a little bit of money. <laughs> Family fortune right that. there. Family fortune. It would be wonderful. But no, uh, sadly, she just thought that he, he basically has hung the moon and he's just going to be awesome for everything. And and that I really ought to, like, listen to the things that he said. And then I listened to the things that he said. What do you guys <laughs> think of the things that he's said so far? <sighs> Let me get a list. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Senator Marco Rumio who we've spoken of at length, and also senator for uh, Florida. Uh, he wasn't apparently a very big fan of Rex Tillerson and grilled him Wednesday morning during the confirmation hearings um, and was really trying to press him on ties to Russia and Putin and trying to get him to, you know, go on the record, basically, of whether or not Putin was a war criminal because as secretary of state, you kind of have to have that, that political moxie to go around and call the spade, the spade. Um, so during the hear hearing Rubio interrogated Tillerson over Putin's alleged interference with the U S presidential election and Kremlin's military aggression in Syria, Ukraine, Chechnya, and elsewhere. A simple yet pointed question about Putin perhaps best illustrated Rubio's firm and aggressive attack style approach. Is Vladimir Putin a war criminal? Rubio asked. He hemmed and hawed a little bit and said, I would not use that term, Tillerson replied. 
Well, let me describe the situation in Aleppo, and perhaps that will help you reach that conclusion, Rubio said. And then Rubio detailed how Putin uh, directed the Russian military to conduct, quote, a devastating campaign, end quote, that had targeted schools, markets, and other civilian infrastructure, killing thousands in the Syrian city. How dare Marco Rubio make me like him? Man, little Marco is salty lately. Well, I, that's yeah. the thing is, hey, Marco, where in the hell was this when you were running for president? When you were getting the shit slapped out of you by <laughs> Trump, where was this? It it must have been in the bottom of his water bottle. He kept looking for it there. Um, <laughs> I know that's an old joke. Couldn't but find it still the right works. water bottle. Exactly. Um, Rubio bot was low on batteries. He's been recharged now. I guess. So, <clears throat> um, so Whiskey coffee. Tillerson is, um, he's an interesting character. He definitely, he's well-spoken, well-educated, well-traveled, and he's got some, some charisma, you know, and he does have a, a deep, rumbling, soothing voice which may help, I suppose, at conference tables. Uh, but he does have kind of a slick, oily kind of appearance. I'm not sure. Maybe that's because of the whole ExxonMobil thing. Um, but so far, he, he has uh, departed on several issues that, uh, uh, that President-elect Trump has, uh, has used as his party platform at least in the morning of certain days, and then not necessarily in the evening of those days, depending on Twitter. Um, I can't, I can't put a finger on where policy is. <laughs> I really can't. It's tough. Uh, but he's, he's still learning the job. I mean, he or learning about the job. He really has. I mean, he's one of the more inexperienced people in terms of the position he's taking mm -hmm. on this list. Yeah, he's he's definitely inexperienced in. Being a State Department kind of guy, but he does at least have a working knowledge of what's going on in the world. Because he did not, during the hearing, he did not uh, ask any questions like, what's in Aleppo? So, yeah. he's at least informed and aware of the, uh, of the environment. So there's that. Uh, but he does have ties in with Russia, ties in the Middle East. You know, he has a significant conflict of interest. And that seems to be the the thread that binds all of these people together, is their enormous conflicts of interest, financial conflicts of interest across the board. Can they be bought? Are they already bought? I don't know. I, I really don't know. I would like to think the best of people. When they have reached a certain um, platitude, a, cer a certain level of, I have more money than I could possibly spend for the rest of my life, but I'm still going to accumulate more money or power or any of those things. There is a particular mindset, a particular type of personality that goes along with those people. Yep. And to get there, you step on a lot of people. You have to only be centered on the goal of accumulation of that wealth. You're not really... I don't see very many people that get to that point as a Florent philanthropist the whole time. Usually you get there and then you become one when you realize that just like your partner, Jacob Marley, there's too many, ch too many links in your chain <laughs> kind of thing. Um, and then you have to start, you know, getting rid of those links. Uh, but you have to accumulate those links first. And I think that everybody on this list is a billionaire. Pretty damn close. Yeah. I, I don't know what the net worth is. You know, that'd be another thing. It's like, oh, let's let's add up the net worth of all the people that are just listed here. Didn't for they do that? Like, didn't that happen? Somebody probably uh, did. 
I feel like there was an article about how at one point everybody who had been um, like suggested to be appointed to Trump's cabinet, uh, that was all figured out. And they came up with uh, some kind of number like they, their, their combined wealth was more than like the bottom 40 percent of Americans. Wow. The, like, Trump's cabinet entire- picks so far are worth a combined 13 billion. That's as of 12, 20, 2016. That's a lot of money. And that includes President Trump at $3.7 billion, who is actually number two on his list. Who's the, who's the top? Education secretary, completely and totally unqualified, uh, vouchers mm, for everyone, Betsy DeVos. Ah, uh, yes, Betsy DeVos. Well, let's, let's talk about her since she's been brought up. We'll just go... Go down the list there. Elizabeth Betsy DeVos, um, formerly Prince, a businesswoman, philanthropist from Michigan, um, prominent member of the Republican Party. Obviously, all of these people are prominent members of the Republican Party, or worse, the Tea Party, specifically the Tea Party, yeah. several of them. Um, known for advocacy of school choice, voucher programs, ties to the Reformation Christian community. Um, committee woman. She also donated an awful lot of money to uh, Trump's campaign. Mm. Um, and also she is the... Um, DeVos is married to Rick Dick DeVos and is the daughter-in-law of billionaire Richard DeVos, the co-founder of Amway. <laughs> So that is where her fortune has come from, Amway. Um, and her brother is uh, Eric Prince, a former U.S. Navy SEAL officer and the founder of uh, Academy, formerly known as Blackwater USA, which is now a... Gone through 18 different name changes. Which is a mercenary group. Mm-hmm. They're the, uh, the guns for hire you know, security forces. Yeah. They've actually played a, a big role in, in several of those, like, black ops books from, you know, Tom Clancy and things like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Those are the guys. I, I had a listener just say, Trump is like a Kickstarter campaign. The more you donate, the more you get. Not wrong. Not wrong at all. Accurate. Yeah. It's just the campaign we missed. We were focused on things like games and like cool shirts. We didn't realize that vote or uh, contribute to Trump's Kickstarter presidency. <laughs> wow. Also, just to fact check myself, um, the the numbers uh, that I quoted, it's actually this is a little outdated, but it it looks like it was um, they have more net worth than the bottom third of americans so like 33 percent, not 40 um and this is back when it was 9.5 billion and that was greater than the 43 million least wealthy households in america and i actually i was looking that up at the same time apparently amber was so i found it on politifact in which they determined it to be mostly true um the reason mostly true is because they highlight that it's possible that a group of 17 ordinary Americans is that the word they use 17 ordinary might also be the same because they um, talk about what net worth actually means so um, they're looking at things like savings and retirement and debt and things like that whereas this particular statement is solely pointing out that 9.5 billion dollars is more than 43 million households have in the United States so yes that's that's kind of the 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 one reason why it's mostly true instead of entirely true, because it is entirely true. More net worth than one third of all of America. Yeah. The important wow. stipulation there is uh, more than 43 million of the least wealthiest households in America. Right. Well, yeah, because that's that's where you'd start adding up. You'd add up from the bottom. Um, yeah, it's just important to mention that bit of it. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> um, 
Also, apparently, uh, you know, just for, for us local people in, in the Orlando area, uh, DeVos Sr., uh, Richard Marvin DeVos Sr., DeVos's father-in-law, is the owner of the Orlando Magic. Yep. Amway Arena. Yeah, so, hmm. The Am- Okay, yeah. I didn't understand the, all the connection there with the arena and, and yeah, okay. So that's money. That's lots of money there. Um, by the way, uh, she has no background in education at all. No, she homeschooled all her she children. She homeschooled all, all of hers. Uh, so she has no knowledge of the public education system. She would simply like it to go away. And Yes, be because she's very of, much in favor of vouchers, which would provide government money to essentially religious schooling. Yes. Um, and... The more religious schooling you have getting government money, the more religious schools you get, and that hampers the public school system heavily. Yeah, it's not specifically that she wants to do away with the public school system. She just is far more in favor of a religious education, a fundamentalist religious education. Um, Just like she had. Just like she had, just like she gave to her children. So... Okay, so let's pick another one. Let's go back up the list to the CIA director position. Mike Pompeo. Michael Richard, known as Mike Pompeo, born 1963, American politician, U.S. representative for Kansas's 4th Congressional District since 2011, member of the Tea Party movement within the Republican Party, he uh, was a Kansas representative of the National uh, Republican National Committee. So a committee member as well. Okay. See where, where these ties are. See, I'm, I'm still fixed on Trump is only picking the last 150 people he knows. So if they, if they did a great service to his campaign, he's they're on the short list. Because... It's what have you done for me lately? And lately yeah. they got him in, into the presidential seat. So, director of the CIA. <laughs> um, West Point graduate. Um, served as a cavalry officer patrolling the Iron Curtain before the fall of the Berlin Wall, apparently. Um, also served in the 2nd Squadron, 7th Cavalry, in the 4th Infantry Division. And served his last tour in the Gulf War. So, okay, he's a soldier. Um, Any law enforcement experience? Founded Thayer Aerospace and Private Security in 2006. So, no. Well, no, he's actually, also no, been... he sold that interest in 2006. He's also been a uh, long been a vocal supporter of expanding the government's surveillance powers. In an op-ed published in the Wall Street Journal this January, he argued forcefully against blunting, quote unquote, the government's surveillance powers and called for a fundamental upgrade to America's surveillance capabilities. Mm. He wants uh, Congress to pass a law reestablishing the collection of all metadata and combining it with publicly available financial and lifestyle information into a comprehensive searchable database. Legal and bureaucratic impediments to surveillance should be removed. That includes Presidential Policy Directive 28, which bestows privacy rights on foreigners and imposes burdensome requirements to justify data collection. Uh, So we have the... The all-seeing eye of the state, but the CIA, Little big brother, but the CIA, as chartered, is not supposed to be able to look at U.S. citizens. They have to look abroad. Legally, cannot. Yeah. Well, yes, he'd like that to change. Then he should be on the FBI. <laughs> um, he also, uh, in 2010, received eighty thousand dollars in donations from Coke Industries. Um. Hmm. And its employees, apparently. Then that was a, a thing. Um, he became president of Century International, an oil field equipment company. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of interesting uh, hands in a lot of lot of pots here. Um, 
Interesting. I don't like it. <laughs> nope. Don't. Well, it's also like it. just. Let's see. Uh, National isn't lifetime member of the National Rifle Association. Uh, opposes the Affordable Care Act. Uh, strongly opposed to abortion, except for the mother's life is at risk. And it can go on and on. Yeah. Okay. All right. There's another uh, another person for the basket. John Kelly for Homeland Security Secretary. John F. Kelly. John Francis Kelly. Currently a professional security studies and scholar in residence at the National Defense University. Wait, what? There's a National Defense University? Where the hell is this? NDU.edu. Educating, developing, and inspiring national security leadership. <laughs> it's in D.C. Founded in 1976. Interesting campus. Uh, okay. An cool. inter- internationally recognized graduate level university with five colleges and multiple centers of excellence, uh, it says. Focused on joint education, leader development, and scholarship in national security matters. Huh. Didn't even know it existed. I'm now interested about it. That's going over here for later. Yeah, you learn all sorts of things. What? Listen to this show. Um, <clears throat> consultant to the United States Water Partnership, established by Secretary of State Hillary Clinton in 2012. Also serves as co-chair of the United States Institute of Peace, Niger River Task Force, examining water security questions and conflict mitigation. So, North Dakota Access Pipeline, I'm thinking, might have some things to talk about there. Uh, might. For what I'm reading here, though, I'm not certain about him. I haven't really heard much, yeah. but when I'm reading him, I'm going, okay, I like what I'm seeing. He's a teacher. Okay. By yeah. and large, he's a teacher and, you know, writing writing grants and academic research and, you know, he's doing a lot of that. Um, he actually worked with JAG as well. Yeah. The Judge Advocate General, for those that uh, that don't know the acronym. Um, born in Detroit. Not that that matters a whole lot. Um, he did pass the Michigan State Bar Exam, so he is an attorney. Mm-hmm. Uh, served as a special attorney general in Michigan. So he, you know, he's. I think he's got some chops. He retired as a colonel from the U.S. Army Reserves Civil Affairs Branch. So he is a bureaucrat. He is a paper pusher. He is in the exact proper right position he's for himself. Then. Probably right in, yeah, this is very much in his bailiwick. Um, uh task force officer to a joint federal law enforcement unit dedicated to counterterrorism research during the global war on terror. JTTF. Did yeah. we did we win the global war on terror? I mean, no. did we ever establish the the war? Did we did we finalize that through through Congress? Do we declare war on on terror? Just like we declared war on drugs. Yeah. Um Graduate of Army Command and General Staff College. So, yeah, he's uh, film industry involvement. <laughs> what? Advocate of Michigan as a site for burgeoning digital arts as, as a cultural medium and created tax incentives for the industry in 2002. Um, interesting. Cool. Okay, so looks like he's a film buff. Or at least he certainly is supporting the arts in that in that way. Um, so that's cool. So he knows how to film us. <laughs> that's probably very good for uh, for this particular position. Probably okay, honestly. I think that think that one's okay. John Kelly for Homeland Security Secretary. Um, wow. I think he's got the chops for it, at least. Yeah, especially what his Fulbright scholarship research was. He was conducting research on comparative federalism 
His academic research has focused on retained sovereignty and policy development of subnational government. Hmm. I'm, okay. This might actually be a choice that I actually don't disagree with. Sounds good, actually. I'm, I'm not seeing anything overtly political about him. He's just all about security and, and how that works. So, and conflict resolution, which yeah. that's what I want. So, okay, and John we, John Kelly for Homeland Security. And when you consider that one of the early candidates for the position was Sheriff Arapo out of mm. Arizona, well, uh, yeah, he looks great. Oh, yeah. yeah. Big departure from that, that first choice. Some, somebody slipped this name in saying, I think you need this guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. T- take a look at John Kelly. Um, Okay. On to the Department of Transportation. Elaine Chow. Uh, Elaine Lan Chow. Born in Taipei, Republic of China. Very important to note, Republic of China there. Um, First Asian American woman and the first Taiwanese American in U.S. history to be appointed to a president's cabinet served as the 24th United States Secretary of Labor under President George W. Bush and deputy deputy what the de- deputy combined deputy secretary okay of transportation <laughs> under George H. W. Bush um so she's well, at least her at least she, been smart in the positions they put her in ones that are not going to directly piss off China that's true yeah uh so secret, secret, so she has been the Secretary of Labor, and she has already been the Deputy Secretary of Transportation. So she actually has experience in the job. Um, oh, she's married to Mitch McConnell. Yeah. Ah, there it is. <laughs> oh, wait. There it is. The Senate Majority Leader. <clears throat> Who said well, he was not going to recuse himself from the confirmation. Yeah. Well. <laughs> well, why would he if it's up to him? Yeah, true. Um, I would I would want to avoid the fight with my <laughs> wife. Yeah, that. think, like, that'd be a super <laughs> sweet confirmation. But like, you're the Department of Transportation, uh, up for the Department of Transportation. And yet, every time I've ever let you drive, you seem to get lost. Do you oh. think you can handle this? Like, we are not having this conversation here. Oh, we're having this conversation here, <laughs> and I empty the dishwasher every goddamn night, and you don't do anything. You don't hey, do really, anything. Really? Really, Mitch? We're going to do this right here in front of all these people? <laughs> <laughs> oh, she edited the yearbook. That's nice. <laughs> yeah, it's it's in here. You know, you never know what you're going to find in, in Wikipedia. Um, put that on every resume, <laughs> even if it's a <laughs> I edited my yearbook. Why did you put this on here? It was good enough for Elaine Chow. <laughs> uh, she received a Bachelor's of Arts degree in economics uh, and also an MBA from Harvard Business School. Do you um, think when she gets mad, she calls him Yertle the Turtle? <laughs> I think, I think that... she does it in, in uh, her dialect of Chinese, so he has no idea. I think he is, in fact, turtly enough for her. She's like, no, 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 it means honorable man. Oh, wow. (laughs) (laughs) You went there. Oh, okay. That's good. That's good. Um, They've been married since 1993. Um, Thank you, Amber. You're going to make these next four years tolerable. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, we need you. Don't go away. Um, (laughs) Please. (laughs) Come find you. Okay. Okay. she she has experience in the job, which is more than we can say for the president elect himself, and a few of these other picks. So I mean, yes. th- there is that. So there's that. So I I think that she would at least not be a bad choice. I'll go with that. She's not a bad choice. I guess. Okay. <clears throat> She's a choice. It's the best I can do for that one. (laughs) Now, um, Health and Human Services, Tom Price. (laughs) 
Thomas Edmonds Price. <laughs> American physician. And it's politician. Just such a white person name. Edmonds? Ed Thomas Edmonds Th Thomas Price. Thomas Edmonds Price. Um Yeah, it is yeah, just it's big it's a hoity toity name. Very hoity toity. Mm. Um member of the Republican Party, obviously, at this point. Um so, uh, from Georgia. Um, orthopedic surgeon. Orthopedics, okay. Oh, uh, he currently serves as chairman of the House Budget Committee. Hmm. So, if you're very pleased with the way the Republicans have been handling the budget, <laughs> then he's your guy. I mean, I'm fucking elated. Yeah. <laughs> um... Let's okay, see. here's a, a, yeah. some, a semi good thing, kind of. Okay. Con considering like everything else that's going on involving the ACA, mm -hmm. while some Republicans have attacked the Affordable Care Act without proposing an alternative, Mr. Price has introduced bills offering a detailed, comprehensive replacement plan in every Congress since 2009. Is the Empowering Patients First Act? The major provisions of the act include tax deductions and credits to aid in the purchasing of health insurance, the promotion of state-based high-risk insurance pools, the creation of individual and small employer membership associations and association health plans, allowing for interstate insurance markets, a reform of malpractice lawsuits and loan and replacement and loan and loan repayment programs. Hmm. This act intends the fund to fund itself through cuts to future spending increases, most commonly known as sequestration. Oh, the bill would create incentives for people to contribute to health savings accounts. Yep. Yeah. That's the problem. Oh, suck a dick. He, no. Yeah. He uh, probably needs to. He also opposes abortion and supports the proposed Protect Life Act. Su supported the proposed life Protect Life Act of 2011. No. Which would have denied Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act funding to health care plans that offered abortion. See, I was I was trying to give him a little bit of of leeway mm -hmm. because at least he had uh, he, a plan. He was. I didn't oh, say it was good. He I was rated. He was rated at one hundred by the National Right to Life Center. He was rated oh, at zero by Planned Parenthood and Narl. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, and and he loves it so much that he participated in the twenty eleven March for Life. So he's an advocate for anti-abortion. And he is your and, health and human services. Secretary. And voted in favor of constitutionally defining marriage as one man, one woman. Yeah, I was just reading that. Um, does not support federal regulation of farming. Wait, what? <laughs> he's voted against regulating and restricting farmers earning him a 70% from the American Farm Bureau Federation. Uh, however, due to his disbelief, the National Farmers Union gave him a 0% approval rating. He supported the Farm Dust Regulation Protection Act, Prevention Act, stating that it would keep the Environmental Protection Agency from applying too many regulations. So he's also anti-EPA. Uh, um voted for Agricultural Disaster Assistance Act of 2012, which did not pass. Um, signed a pledge sponsored by Americans for Prosperity, promising to uh, vote against yeah. any global warming legislation that would raise taxes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that's uh, not a good one. All right, and we already talked about percent from National Ref Association, zero percent from Brady campaign. Yeah, shocking. Hey, here's a name that we're familiar with: former governor of Texas Rick Perry. He makes the list it. at <laughs> for energy secretary. He's just going to do it long enough until he can shut it down. <laughs> <laughs> Destroy it from the inside. James Richard Rick Perry. Well, 47th governor be, of Texas. How's he going to get to a job? Where's my office? What, what, what's the name of this place? <laughs> that is true. He does not know what department he is 
ahead of. Oh uh, yes, that that was a gaff that he had. He he said, um, "I'm going to eliminate five departments," and he couldn't name them. They started, you know, rattling them off, and got to like two, and then it's like, mm, and there is there are more. I just don't. <laughs> I don't know what they were. Well, yeah, he said he said five and then tried to name them, got two out, <laughs> couldn't remember the third. Someone suggested the EPA. He said, yep, the EPA. Then he said, no, not the EPA, but I got problems with them too. And then admitted, I cannot yep. remember the third. Like I just – I, yeah. like, I don't remember it. Sorry. Yep. I like it. Because that happened. It uh, yeah. bodes well. Uh, definitely a Texan through and through, fifth generation Texan. Um, we're f- pretty familiar with him in general. Um, let's I, see. I have a feeling he was picked for Department of Energy simply because, wait, he's from Texas, long-term Texas family, and Texas got oil. Yeah, maybe. Uh, Perry has called himself a firm believer in intelligent design as a matter of faith and intellect. And has expressed support for its teaching alongside evolution in Texas schools. Yep. Yay. Yep. You know, Uh, I'm trying to find his actual, like, environmental or energy policies. I'm having a hard time. Yeah, I'm not seeing a whole lot on it. Um... Huh. Corridor projects. The Trans-Texas Corridor. Okay, here we Uh, go. Rick Perry on energy and oil. mm -hmm. Defend Keystone XL and other oil and gas exploration. Sued the EPA for regulating carbon emissions. Drill, baby, drill. No, Mm -hmm. No federal energy subsidy let states decide on nuclear waste. Put 1.2 million Americans to work in domestic energy. Uh, don't put economy in jeopardy based on unsettled science, quote unquote. This was in reference to climate change. Mm-hmm. Um, Five thousand dollar initiative, or I'm sorry, incentive for plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. Man-made global warming. Uh, yeah, he's not a believer. Very, not a believer. Yeah. In that, uh, more funding to develop domestic energy supplies. Use federal funds for nuclear cleanup with state input. Share offshore oil development revenue with states. And federal tax incentives for energy with state decisions. Wait, wait. Let, 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 let's get them using here. Um, use federal funds for nuclear cleanup with state input. Okay. Earlier, no federal <laughs> energy subsidy. Let states decide on nuke waste. Yep. The question was, do you support opening the National Nuclear Repository at Yucca Mountain? And his response was, Congressman Paul and Governor Romney are correct when it comes to allowing the states to compete with each other rather than depositing nuclear waste in Nevada. And I'll just add that when you think about France, who gets over 70% of their energy from nuclear power, they deal with the issue via glassification. Innovation is the answer to this. We need to have a discussion in this country about... Mm -hmm our 10th amendment and the appropriateness of it as it's been eroded by Washington DC for all these many years, whether it's healthcare, whether it's education or whether it's dealing with energy, we don't need to be subsidizing energy in any form or fashion, allow the States to make the decision and some state out there will see the economic issue and they will have it in their state. That actually sounds, <laughs> that actually does sound kind of reasonable. Hmm. Even a blind squirrel finds an acorn every now and then. Yeah. However, he's really unreasonable on so many other things. So, I think we could do better, but I think that on pretty much all of these. Uh, Okay, so how about the Department of the Interior? Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke. Ryan Zinke. Uh, (laughs) no, No middle name, apparently. Um, Oh, I played college football, University of Oregon. That's that's oh. good. Um, Did he also edit the yearbook? I don't know. I'm gonna have to look look at that. Let's see. Uh, Maybe that's what they all have in common. He was an outside linebacker. Um, he has a bachelor's of science in geology from 1984, and also an MBA because, of course, everyone's a business administrator these days. Um, from National University in California. 
He's also uh, a Navy SEAL. Hmm. He actually has. Oh, he also has a degree, a uh, Master of Science in Global Leadership from the University of San Diego. So he's he's been around, and he uh, definitely continued his education. So he's big on that. Navy SEAL is uh, definitely nothing to sneeze at. From um, 1986 to 2008. Retired, retired as the rank commander. Of commander. Yeah. Uh, basic That's a un- long SEAL career. Basic underwater demolition. <laughs> Buds. There's, there's not a whole lot basic about that, but yeah, there it is. Um, served with SEAL Team 1. So, okay. Yeah, he's, he's got some chops there. Um, served in the Montana Senate in 2008, uh, serving 2009 to 2011. Uh, let's see, tenure. And ran unopposed. Hmm. Hmm. You know, I'm not seeing a whole lot that makes him qualified for this at all other than I he mean, has a degree in geology is so, this a, a case of contributions financial campaign contributions hmm. I don't think so because honestly I don't think he's in a position of having made that much money um, I think this might have just been somebody gave a suggestion because they knew him Hmm. Yeah, I'm not. I just. I don't see. I don't see why. Now, in, yeah, in, it represented in, Montana's at-large congressional seat for one term. In 2010, Zinke signed a letter calling global warming a threat multiplier for instability in the most volatile regions of the world, and stated that the clean energy and climate challenge is America's new space race. The letter spoke of catastrophic costs and unprecedented economic consequences that would result from failing to act on climate change and asked President Obama and Nancy Pelosi to champion sweeping clean energy and climate legislation. This is an accident. He's not supposed to be here. Okay, I like him. A lifelong hunter and fisherman, the 55-year-old Zinke has defended public access to federal lands, even though he frequently votes against environmentalists on issues ranging from coal extraction to oil and gas drilling. This summer, he quit his post as a member of the GOP platform writing committee after the group included language that would have transferred federal land ownership to the states. Uh, that's, well, hmm. He's all over the place, then. Yeah. I wonder if it's a not in my backyard. Here's an interesting statement. Mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) And and interesting in that it just boggles my mind how he strung these two thoughts together. Clean air and clean water are absolute top priorities when we talk about responsible energy development. However, the final rule issued by the Obama administration does nothing to further protect our resources. This rule is a stark reminder that we need to invest in infrastructure projects like the Keystone Pipeline. Okay, so I'm seeing connections now. That's okay. So that's why he got involved, and to have his to have a career that also has those environmentalist views. In addition, he kind of covers all the bases. Yeah, because he can pull. We can point to his early career as being, you know, a champion for. For climate change, um, you know, and and doing all of that, while his later career, his real political career, has been greased. Apparently, he prides himself on being a Theodore Roosevelt Republican. And no, sorry, the mm. Theodore Roosevelt Conservation <clears throat> Partnership president uh, is very supportive of his appointment. His nomination, whatever. Oh, he he does not rate very well. Uh, Zinke frequently votes against environmental issues. Three um, percent rating yeah. from the League of Conservation Voters, not conservative, a, but conservation voters. Um, 
in a 2014 debate, he said of climate change, it's not a hoax, but it's not proven science either. Okay. So, yeah, which way did he go, George? Which way did he go? Yeah, um, he's... Mm. It, it, okay, so this sounds like he has, sold, he has sold out his principles. As he's been in office longer, his principles on that have waned, and now he's all Keystone XL pipeline kind of stuff. So this would be a follow the money and see who's supporting his uh, his political career, and I bet that it's very heavy in the energy industry, being big oil. So I'm, if left to his own devices, I think he would be okay. However, I think he also has a price tag on him, and he's already been sold. Yeah. Feel free and change my mind, Mr. Ryan Zinke. Um, but don't kill me, because you're a Navy SEAL. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> and then we have... <laughs> this shit show. <laughs> <laughs> I'll call it what it is. Linda McMahon for Small Business Administration. I need those air horns. Linda, <laughs> Mar- Linda Marie for don't McMahon. Know who this, is, this is the wife of Vince McMahon, the guy who had the WWF, now the WWE, and is essentially the man behind all of the quote unquote world of professional wrestling in the United States. This is his wife. She actually runs the company. Yeah, but she's not the face of it. In 2009, McMahon <clears throat> left the WWE to run as a Republican for a seat in the U.S. Senate from Connecticut, but lost to Democratic Part- Party nominee Richard Blumenthal in the general election. Uh, she was Republican nominee for Connecticut's other Senate seat in the 2012 race, but lost to another Democratic representative, Chris Murphy. Um, she donated heavily. I'm aware of that. Um, but yeah, she's all TV and, and wrestling. It's, it's a thing. She negotiated many of the company's business deals, uh, with outside vendors, establishing the company's first line of action figures, the wrestling superstars <laughs> in 1984. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, During an interview with Detroit News, when asked what it was like being a CEO in a testosterone-charged industry, McMahon replied, It's a lot of fun, and I'm an only child, so I grew up as my father's son and mother's daughter. I was quite a jock. I played baseball, basketball. I think that background made Vince and I very compatible. A very good understanding of of the male physique. I'm very comfortable (laughs) in a guy environment. I have to say that (laughs) there are very strong women in this company as well. Our human resource division and our consumer goods division are headed by women. It's still a testosterone business, and I like it. Oh, I bet you do. I bet you do, Linda McMahon. Yeah. Um... At least she didn't use a phrase that I was hoping she wouldn't use. And I mean, it would have been, I never could have had sex again if I ever heard her say it. <sighs> well, I you need to you know. <laughs> that working in some environment makes her moist. Oh, oh. <laughs> well, now that you've said it, you know. Um, At that point, I would just go. I, oh. I, I'm done. I, I, I can't ever again. I, I, I think just. This statement right here, and we'll move along because it really sums up everything that I want to say. I really have a very good understanding of the male physique. I'm very compatible in a guy environment. <laughs> yeah, that, that came really close. I'm going, Ooh. Oh, God. <laughs> um, hmm, yeah, so um, lots of lots of money. Um, yeah. Okay. <sighs> Small business administration because she's a businesswoman. I think that's the only thing. And she filled the uh, she filled the girl slot, but she's very comfortable in a guy environment, so she was cool. Now we've got Mr. Scott Pruitt for EPA Administrator, the Environmental Protection Agency Administration role. Edward Scott Pruitt, American lawyer and Republican politician from the state of Oklahoma. Um, 
Yeah, let's see. Danville, Kentucky is where he was born. Huh. Yeah, football, basketball, okay, baseball, blah, 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 blah. Lieutenant Governor, Attorney General. Um, where was the Attorney General? Okay. Huh. Okay. Um, Pruitt calls himself a leading advocate against the EPA's activist agenda. The New York Times and The Independent have described him as a climate change denier. He has said global warming of global warming that, quote, that that debate is far from settled. We don't know the trajectory. It is on an unsustainable course, nor do we know the extent by which the burning of fossil fuels, man's contribution to that, is making this far worse than it is. You know, one out of 18, he's right. You know, it is unsustainable. Yeah, well, yeah. At that point, right? <laughs> yeah, that, that is correct. Um, I'll give him the one. Uh, other state attorney generals uh, has sued to fight the EPA's clean power plan uh, and regulations on methane emissions, which we really do need to work on. Um, Gene Karpinski, the president of the League of Conservation Voters, described the nomination as being, quote, like the fox guarding the hen house in response to his nomination. he's a proponent of mandatory ultrasound when it comes to abortions. Okay. In June 2012, he appealed the Oklahoma County District Court ruling that said that uh, requiring the women undergoing abortion to have an ultrasound within an hour of the procedure, he appealed their decision that it was unconstitutional. Somebody should appeal his face. Nice. With a nice. potato peeler. I want to take his face one. off. Face off. Um, hmm. <laughs> Been successful in raising campaign in campaign contributions from the energy industry, helping him to is. become chairman of the Republican Attorney General Association. So he has a long history of having his pockets lined from the energy industry. So it is indeed like the fox guarding the hen house. So goodbye, clean air and water. We will sorely miss you. So now we have um, Andrew. The president of Hardee's. Andrew Puzder for labor secretary. Fuck this dude in particular. He, yeah, th- this is one of the main employers of, you know, minimum wage fast food workers. Who doesn't believe in the minimum wage? Yeah. Yeah. He would Andrew. pay them less if he could. He opposes the Obama administration's overtime regulations and the Affordable Care Act. Andrew Franklin Andy Puzder. <laughs> uh, current CEO of CKE Restaurants uh, and the founder of Carl's Jr. Um, well, Carl Kager. Karcher? Yeah, Karcher uh, founded Carl's Jr., but uh, that is now part of CKE Restaurants, which he runs. He's also criticized paid sick leave policies. Oh, yeah, because, uh, yeah, just come on in and cough all over those uh, those Arby's burgers. Yeah. That's, yeah. Mm, I'd like yeah, the, apparently I'd like the, the big uh, Montana with extra snot, please. <laughs> In his, in his opinion, the Affordable Care Act created a government-mandated restaurant recession. Wow. Which is interesting, because I had just read something the other day about the restaurant business being at, like, the peak that it's, it's been for quite some time. It's booming, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it's basically happens to people out of health care. Puzder yeah. raised money for the Trump campaign uh, and with his wife contributed $332,000 to Trump's campaign in joint fundraising committees. Uh, He was a Trump uh, presidential trustee, victory finance chair for California, spokesperson for the senior economic advisor, oh, and senior economic advisor to the campaign, 
uh, also served as a delegate to the 2016 Republican National Convention. And as the chairman of the Platforms Committee Restoring the American Dream Subcommittee on the Economy, Job Creation, and the Debt. Wow. So... Yeah. Great. That's a that's a great pick. Great. Mm-hmm. I hope great you all pick. have loved making money, however little it is, because that time's about to frickin' end. The president of the AFL-CIO said he was a man whose business record is defined by fighting against working people. Wow. And he's going to be the labor secretary, everyone. Uh-huh. Isn't Here's- that great? Oh, here's where we need to let, let's go ahead and pull up the whole thing. And go, All right, guys, you know, sure, you might have problems. Yes, people might get fired and everything else. But, you know, those whole right to work states don't care. Start forming unions. Say goodbye to Fred. Bye, Fred. Bye, yeah, Fred. Fred. He had to run. Mm, he's uh, yeah, he's going to be uh, working on some labor uh, later. So he's, <laughs> he got to run. OK, so moving on to Commerce Secretary, we got uh, we got us. Wilbur Louis Ross Jr. American born November 28th, 1937. American investor and former banker known for restructuring failed companies in industries such as steel, coal, telecommunications, foreign investment, and textiles. Specialized in leveraged buyouts and distressed businesses. Nice. Um, Forbes magazine lists Ross as one of the world's billionaires with a net worth of $2.9 billion. Um, yeah. Oh. Some of my family who've been involved in these kind of things, he uh, founded the International Coal Group, which has now gone public. Uh, the United Mine Workers of America... Uh, protested the bankruptcy regulations that allowed him to set up the International Coal Group free of labor unions, health care, and pensions. Uh, also, he was apparently directly involved and intimately knew the mines, the what is known as the Sago Mines, where in, I forget when it was, I think it was uh, 2005, uh, 12 miners died due to safety problems. Hmm. Because the mine partially collapsed. That's so awesome. That's so great. I mean, really. It's just <laughs> yeah, it, so the Department fantastic. of Labor showed that they'd had over 208 citations for safety violations. Oh, that's 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 nice. That's great. I have to change your you guys' uh, heads since we lost lost a person. Oh, God. Okay. I guess. Uh, how about I just add a whole window? That's the wrong one. This one. There you go. Wrong window. Wrong window. Oh. Rear window. Something like that. Um, yeah, there we go. Okay. I'm so big. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what? Careful there, you know. Okay. That'll, that'll just we be talk. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I'm trying to... Get, I want to move my head. There we go. There, it's just... not who we wanted it from. Oh, uh, this is... There we go. Let's okay. See. No. Okay. <clears throat> um... <laughs> so, yeah, he... Um... Oh, he worked with the Rothschilds. Yes. <laughs> mm, 24 years in the New York office of Rothschilds, Inc. <laughs> where he ran the bankruptcy restructuring advisory practice. He foreclosed on people. Nice. Um, wow. Now, okay. So. What I love is his political activities, mm-hmm. which makes me go, huh. Uh, Ross served under President Bill Clinton on the board of U.S. Russia Investment Fund. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Um, Serves currently on the Board of Trustees for the Brookings Institution and the Board of Advisors for the Yale School of Management. He donated $10 million to the uh, for the construction of Evans Hall at the Yale School of Management. Well, that's nice. Um, okay. 
Well, so he's for uh, Commerce Secretary. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I I guess I don't I don't know that there's anybody that he would put in there that has such a banker a banker past that and happens to be so filthy rich that would that would satisfy the the position from like an ethical standpoint. I mean, he's got he's got to have contacts in all of it. You know, lots of lots of deep deep pockets and and follow the money everywhere. So, hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Last one, last one. Stephen Munchen, Treasury Secretary. I'm actually surprised that the other guy wasn't uh, Treasury Secretary. Stephen Termer Munchen. Termer. Turner? Turner. T-E-R-N-E-R? That's a weird name. Yeah, Turner. <clears throat> and I accidentally... T- okay. Okay. Uh, former Goldman Sachs partner and senior manager and hedge fund investor. And yeah. the only reason that he has a page on Wikipedia is because it was announced that he would be nominated for Secretary of the Treasury. Because it's like the very first line. That's what he's known for. Um bought failed housing lender IndyMac, rebuilt the bank as chairman and CEO in the subsequent years. He's, <laughs> he's not only a former banker with Goldman Sachs and a hedge fund investor, but he also has bought his own banks and runs his own banks. Okay. I guess that's a thing that people do. That is a thing that people do. Um, uh, John Morgan of uh, Morgan and Morgan owns a bank. Do you know that? <laughs> I'm not surprised by yep. it. Yep, opened his own bank. Um, he's one of the younger members of the uh, of the cabinet. <laughs> Born in 1962. Um, Big into movies. Yeah, he actually founded Rat Pack Dune Entertainment as a side business. Um, oh, he actually was a financer on uh, the X-Men film franchise and Avatar. I have seen Rat Pack Dune Entertainment. Okay. Um, Munchen was also co-chairman of uh, Relativity Media, which I've seen. Oh, Relativity Media went bankrupt? Mm-hmm. Oh, I did not know that. Okay, well, I learned something new every day. Uh, the nomination for Secretary of Treasury. Let's see, what does they say about that? Um, <laughs> he called Trump's economic agenda a bold one that creates good paying jobs and defends the American worker. <laughs> Progressive groups condemned the move as they argued that Munchen made money out of the financial crisis by, quote, aggressively foreclosing on tens of thousands of families, according aggressively. to... Aggressively. Uh, according to the Take on Wall Street spokesman. Uh, as the CEO of One West, the New York Times noted that Munchen's selection, quote, fits uneasily with much of Mr. Trump's campaign attacks on the financial industry. This is one of those draining the swamp into the cabinet kind of mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. Um, oh, but you know what? After the nomination was announced, Munchen resigned his, from his position on the board of trustees of the Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles, to which he had donated between 100000 to $250,000 uh, when the pick was announced. Munchen was also a member of the boards of the UCLA Health System, the New York Presbyterian Hospital, and the Los Angeles Police Foundation. Um, I don't know why he would resign from the board of a museum. You know, of all the things to have have ties in that would be an ethical problem, 
conflict of interest. This does that doesn't seem to be one of them. Yeah, you'd think. Yeah, I was about to give him credit for that, and then I saw what he resigned from. It's like, oh, okay, no, no, that that's just weird. Then there's what um, he didn't resign from. Yeah. Huh. Okay, so um, in a November 30th, 2016 interview on CNBC, Munchen called it the Trump administration's job to, quote, make sure that the average American has wage increases and good jobs. Furthermore, he said his priority was getting a sustained growth of GDP of three or four percent. He said in order to get there, quote, our number one priority is tax reform. Tax reform to increase the GDP. <sighs> tax reform to exactly increase the GDP. It's an incentive program to get more businesses to build big, bigger and better things and hire more people and lower, ta- lower the taxes, more businesses will come. That's the idea, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the corporate taxes. Well, that's that's Everybody what he's talking else is about. Everybody going to have to pick up the slack. Well, the corporate taxes are what's supposed to raise the GDP. What? No. <laughs> yeah. Gross what? domestic product. You know, they they want the. That's where the money comes in because from the. No, I mean I understand. But... Yeah. But it's it's trickle down economics. That's that's where this theory comes from. You know, you get the job creators in, and then they piss on you. You know, like. What Trump did, and then it trickles down. Yeah, gotcha. You're back. Yeah. Hmm. You. <laughs> <laughs> um. Hmm. It just slithers down your spine. It's cold by the time it gets to you. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um. Hmm. Okay. So that um, that rounds out the cabinet. Um. Congratulations, America. This is what we have to look forward to. Yeah. I'm sure we'll get back to you on this. <laughs> yeah. Should um, we be, like, listing the National Suicide Prevention Hotline after we do <laughs> these things? Like, should we be reading that out loud should, at the end? I, I think I, I need somebody to call in and and do a little PSA for us. And then I'll put you know, some Sarah McLaughlin music behind it. I'll do it. Like, you know, you know, the, the PETA things, you know, yeah, you know, no, animal, animal abuse and everything. Yeah. yeah we, we, we have several. <laughs> I'll even, if you, if you send Great. me that camera, I'll even make sad faces at it that you can like put together. <laughs> oh. Like I'll get in a dog kennel. It'll be good. <laughs> whoa. 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 Listen, that's now entirely it's entirely different. That's a different, that's a different <laughs> show. Like, that's a different show. Different program. It was like, Different show, Amber. Listen. Different show. Listen. Listen. I'm listening. Listening. <laughs> I am. See, I said I'd be looking sad. So that means it it's not gonna go into that different show. It's gonna be like wholesome. Just a sad girl in a dog game. <laughs> <I couldn't get laughs> you can't you fun. can't even get through it. You can't <laughs> even do it. Nope. <laughs> You're so close, so close. I will no, you can't your get to it. To yeah, it's a good, good attempt. Face. Good attempt. But that's almost made it. Not gonna, not almost. gonna happen. Not gonna happen. <laughs> Missed it by that much. Just that much. Yep. <laughs> okay. Um. I think with that, we're gonna wrap this show <laughs> because I can't do any more with that. Um. There, there were some things, you know, with you know, golden showers and things that we don't really need to discuss <laughs> i guess really about a trump centric yeah, yeah. discussion well he it's a trump centric universe lately you know we can't really do much about that that's also the point of the whole thing he decided to kick out cnn for being false then took a thing from breitbart oh yeah 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 um god we could just keep going see we we haven't even scratched the surface which is terrible but you know if you've enjoyed what we've done here and you'd like to help us out there are a few ways that you can help us you could donate to the show through patreon.com slash oh really radio and get early access to show content and uh, see all sorts of things that we're doing out there uh you can also leave us a review out on itunes that'll help get us in front of more people with the algorithms that they use uh also word of mouth is always works 
get us in front of other people. Tell tell them about the show and where you heard your information. And because uh, we do leave the links, so we are at least citing our sources, which is more than we can say about Breitbart. And, of course, you can engage with us directly. Send us messages on the social media or the electronic mail at Podcast at gmail.com. Or if you're the more talkative sort, we've got that voice line, 470-222-6759. It's always ready to take your call or your text. Thank you for choosing to waste your valuable time on us. This has been O'Reilly Radio, part of the Random Acts Company. This work is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 United States license, including the music Rocket and Pimgia, created by Kevin McLeod of Incomtech.com. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so um, it's 11.30. And if you haven't enjoyed what we've done here, you can call the National <laughs> Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255, available 24 hours every day. I'm leaving that in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's staying I, I think in. we're going to need that every show for the next four years. <laughs> yeah. I'm telling you, I will record it. I'm, I may just take that little sample, boom, <laughs> right in. <laughs> Every time.